Okay, welcome to this webinar, How to Excel in Academic Writing. And I just want to say thank you to all our resource persons because I know how busy they are. Faith is a lecturer, Rana is busy. Every single person is busy and I am not paying any of us because it is just humanitarian service. Let me say that because a lot of people come to my DMs and when they ask for personalized services and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, if you need personalized service, you have to you know, pay a token or you get the free services that I have provided on YouTube. And they're like, oh, I thought you were going to do it on humanitarian basis. <laughs> and I don't know how else I can describe what I do on YouTube because this, I have to do the research and put out the content and then at the end of the day, it's free. So I consider it humanitarian, but today's own is special because all our resource persons are doing this free. They are, I'm not paying them for anything. And to be honest, it is a big deal for me. And I hope that at the end of this session, it will be worthwhile your time and your effort for those joining us. Thank you so much to all the participants who have joined us in good time. It was for like, 2 p.m. and we had a lot of people join even before that time. And those who are coming in, thank you also for joining us. And we're just going to briefly introduce our speakers before we start so you know that they have the, the you know, integrity, they have the standing to give you this knowledge that you're going to receive today. My name is Kusema Ise. I am a lawyer and I'm the founder of the Get Ahead Initiative. Actually, uh, the Get Ahead Initiative is just a passion that I run, is a passion project for me. I also have a consulting firm, but this webinar is under the Get Ahead Initiative. That is why it is free. If it was under the consulting firm, it would have been a paid webinar. So uh, basically I provide um, content, I provide guidelines, guidance for those who are looking forward to going to school abroad, whether undergraduate or postgraduate degree. I know that Pinel is going to read my profile, so I'm just going to allow Pinel to share the screen so that she can go ahead to read the speaker's profile and then we can start. I am excited. I'm so pumped up. Pinel, over to you. Thank you, Kusame. Welcome, everyone. Give me a second while I try to share my screen. I'm sorry. Okay, can we all see this if we can? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, welcome once again to uh, the Get Ahead Initiative Program with the theme, How to Excel in Academic Writing. My name is Pinel Oriuye. Um, I will be your, will I say like, uh, voice presenter today while well, you know we have our resource person you know teach us so without wasting much time i'd like to introduce the first person jessica spendorio she's a foreign lawyer trainee at clifford chance frankfurt jessica is currently a foreign lawyer trainee like i mentioned in frankfurt germany at first she first became interested in international arbitration and disputes during law school at the University of Miami, which ultimately influenced a decision to pursue an LLM at Queen Mary University of London in comparative and international dispute resolution several years later to pursue a career in this field. Prior to the LLM, Jessica worked in a national firm in the United States as an associate for several years both in New York and Boston offices and specialized in intellectual property and commercial litigation and counseling for dispute. Welcome, Jessica. Can we please welcome Jessica in the chat box? I'd like to proceed to the second guest we have for today, but I'd like um, Toroja to please do that for us. If you would please take the lead. Georgia, are you there? So the second speaker is Raina Mahapatra. She is LLM graduate of Queen Mary 
University. She is an Indian qualified lawyer. Having completed her undergraduate law studies from Pune in India, she okay, she participated in the world renowned this arbitration moot courts competition during her undergraduate studies. And this in, ignited her interest in the field of arbitration and international dispute resolution. And that moved her to go to LLM to pursue comparative and international dispute resolution at the University Queen, at the Queen Mary University of London. She is a future trainee solicitor at the London Office of the International Law Firm, Evershed Sutherland, and is currently completing a graduate diploma in law at BPP University London as part of a conversion course. Please welcome right now in the chat box. Next, we have uh, Faith Aboyeji. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name well. I'm really sorry. Um, Faith is a scholarship fellow at Dalhousie University, Canada, where she researches in the area of intellectual property law and teaches in the JD program. She's also currently completing a PhD in international copyright law and human development at RMIT University, Australia. Faith is a part of a team of international copyright researchers working on the recognition of a right to research in international copyright law at the American University, Washington. Faith's research and publications in international copyright law has graced the pages of prominent scholarly journals, including the European Intellectual Property Review and the Journal of Law and Medicine. She has also presented a research works at several international conferences. Faith recently completed a six month research fellowship at the prestigious Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition in Germany. In addition to her research portfolio, Faith has, cons has considerable experience teaching law students. She taught for two years at the Thomas More Law School of Australian Catholic University and now teaches at the Scottish School of Law, Dalhousie University. Dalhousie, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrongly. Faith finished with first class honors from both the University of Ilori, Nigeria and the Nigeria Law School and practiced with one of the foremost law firms in Nigeria. Please go welcome Faith in the chat box. Toraja. Georgia, are you there? Do I have to unmute her before she can speak every time? Okay. Well, yes, I think is... you have to. Okay, so the next speaker is Akin today, Baba today, is a MA graduate and um, Chevening scholar. Akin Sude Babatunde is an international development professional with extensive years of combined experience in project management, civic technology, and public policy. He is the head of the Natural Resource Extractives and Climate Change Program of the Premium Times Center for Investigative Journalism. He's currently leading an environmental sustainability and climate change project for journalists, policy analysts, and academic researchers across five countries including Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Liberia, and the Gambia. Apart from that, he has successfully led and executed several projects on social accountability, fact checking, oil and gas, solid minerals, water and marine resources, forest resources and climate change with support from international development organizations, including the Makato Foundation, Ford Foundation, National Resource Governance Institute, Australian Embassy, Oxford Policy Management, Center for Democracy and Development and Results for Development. Akin today has authored over 50 publications on public policy, governance, and fiscal transparency on both local and international media platforms and coordinated three fellowship programs and over 20 capacity development programs and training for over a thousand journalists, researchers, civil society practitioners and government officials, which has produced over 500 reports 
seven policy briefs published in over 30 news agencies and development platforms in West Africa. Please welcome, okay. He's also a civic technology expert and his work on open data and civic technology includes designing a data-driven social accountability project designed to hold the government accountable on how funds released for developmental projects are spent. And between 2017 and 2018, he led the management of Nigeria's first fact-checking project, Dubawa, and has since been and has since been part of training and research for the platform that is now active in five West African countries. He was nominated as a finalist for the Africa Czech Awards in 2018. He's also an ambassador on UNESCO supported media and information literacy Alliance. He's a member of the United Nations Framework of Convention on Climate Change Youth Constituency, a climate reality leader and a volunteer with one campaign where he is also engaged with the Africa Europe Task Force. Akin today was educated at the University of Ibadan, Ibadan, Nigeria, Pan Atlantic University, Lagos, MDF West Africa, Project Management, and has an MA with distinction in media practice for development and social change of the University of Success via the UK and Commonwealth Office Chevening Scholarship for Future Leaders. Please welcome Babatunde Akinwale. Thank you, Toroja. And next we have Mylos Andonovsky. He's an MA graduate, University of Kent, UK, founder and educator, theatre for everyone. Mylos Andonovsky was born in Kumanovo, North Macedonia. He graduated comparative literature in 2012 at the Faculty of Physiology, I believe, within the St. Cyril and Methodius University. In 2014, he obtained his MSc degree in cultural studies at the Institute for Macedonian Literature. In 2015, Andonovsky graduated for the second time at the Department for Theatre Directing Faculty for Dramatic Arts in Skopje. His dissertation was a research in which 31 professional actors took part, titled as the influence of cultural and psychological processes on an actor creating a character. In 2017, he obtained his teaching qualifications at the Faculty of Education, St. Clements of or Orit. Andonovsky is also a certified trainer in the field of adult education and lifelong learning since 2016. In 2021, he obtained his final MA degree as a Chevlin Scholar at the University of Kent in theater making. His English dissertation is based on another research in which six theater directors took part, Katie Michelle, Annie Bogart, Tomi Janesh, Orij Maya Osh, Zoja Buzakowska, and Ivan Popovsky. The dissertation is titled as What Do We Talk About When We Talk About Directing? He has taken part in two international scientific conferences with research work, which looks at the possibilities, influences, and advantages for introducing drama and theater education as an obligatory course in the Macedonian high school education. Contemporary challenges of performance in 2016, Theater Between Politics and Policies, New Challenges, 2018. Parts of the scientific and academic work have been published in scientific journals, Arcs Academica, Issue 4, as well as in media interviews, ETC. From 2014 until 2017, Andonovsky worked as a theater and filmmaking high school teacher at Nova International School, in July 2016 and July 2017, he taught drama at the American University in Bulgaria summer camp. He is the founder and educator or trainer at Theatre for Everyone, an association for theatre education and production. He has directed the following theatre plays, Family Story by Bijana Splanovic, Without Autorial Rights, Collective Authorship Navigators, the Future is Private, written and directed by Andonovsky, 
a solo performance on shame without a title created by Angela Stojanowska. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Milosh. And the last but not the least, Turja. Is she muted again? Thank you, Kusteme. Next is Kusteme say, the founder of the Get Tired Initiative. She's LLM graduate and Chevening Scholar of, um, she attended Queen Mary University of London, UK. Kristen Mace is a unique lawyer who sees beyond the conventional confines of legal practice. Keen about conflict settlement through alternative dispute resolution, she is an advocate for ADR and a member of the Chartered Institute of Mediators and Consulators of Nigeria. Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UK and Queen Mary University of London ADR Society through which she gives full expression to her core passion of amicable resolution of disputes. As a first class law graduate, she has worked with top tier law firms where she engaged in dispute resolution and corporate commercial legal advisory services. She currently offers legal and policy advisory services to the Nigerian Governors Forum, an association of all 36 states governors in Nigeria. Okay. Can you change the slide? Okay. I'm trying to, sorry, I don't know what's wrong with my laptop. All right. Let me go to. Can we see it now? Yes. Okay. She. She is a 2020 Chevening Scholar and a recent graduate of Queen Mary University of London, where she studied comparative and international dispute resolution for an LLM. Her core research interest lies in international arbitration, negotiation strategies, mediation, and other ADR mechanisms for effective dispute resolution. She is also a career and education consultant and founder of the Get Ahead Initiative, where she offers higher education and career consulting services to high achieving individuals. She runs her consulting services through one-on-one -on -one group coaching and mentoring session, including a value packed YouTube channel. She has produced content on career advancement, postgraduate studies, higher education scholarships, job opportunities, and other relevant areas. She enjoys mentoring and have done this through different platforms across Nigeria and the United Kingdom. Mentees usually attest to receiving much clarity about expressing their visions and goals after each mentorship session, and she aims to continue to create similar value in the lives of individuals across the world. Please welcome Kuseme Ise in the chat box. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We have about 35 people now. Thank you so much, um, Pinel and Toroja for reading our speakers. Papa, I would allow our speakers to say one or two things before I throw questions at them because today they are on the hot seat. <laughs> okay. Right now, would you like to start? Uh, I think can I'm, you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so I think it said the host is muting. What I think now should be good? Yes, but I just want to confirm. Jessica, Faith, can you unmute yourself on your own or do I have to unmute you every time? Can you try? I think I can do that on my own, yeah. Okay. Jessica, can now I can unmute. You? Yeah, but I'm not going to be able to do that every time because it's going to be challenging. So I'm going to allow all participants to be able to unmute themselves. 
But please, I would like all of us to stay mute except the resource persons so that we can be able to hear what they are saying, if that is clear. Thank you so much for your understanding. Please, Raina, go ahead. Thank you so much. I hope you are well now. Um, I think just to start off without you know, wasting more time, uh, thank you so much for having me on the panel for discussion. I think I've just completed my um, LLM, both with Kusame and Jessica. And so a lot of what I'm going to be speaking about, I think will come from my experience with the LLM and my undergraduate studies right before that. Um, I'm extremely pleased to be part of a discussion with so many people who I think who have much more experience than me. So I think I'm also going to be learning quite a bit today and I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope that who, all the questions that um, the participants have and all the doubts they have in their minds will be cleared at the end of it. So I'm really looking forward to it. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Raina. Jessica, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you so much for the invitation, Kisame, and the kind introduction. I'm really looking forward to the session. And as Raina said, I'm also coming off the LLM with some um, views as to academic writing for a master's or a postgraduate degree. But prior to doing the LLM, I actually did practice as a litigation associate, but also did publications as well. So I'm hoping to be able to give some insight in persuasive versus academic writing. And there's a lot of distinctions and good tips um, I hope to be able to do. And I'm looking forward to learning from the other speakers today. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I'm also looking forward to learning from you all. <laughs> Milos, really like to go next. Yes, thank you, Kusemi. It's also nice meeting you, let's say, virtually in person. Uh, it's a pleasure. My first reaction when I got the invitation for, for this webinar was, I am an artist, I hate academic writing. What am I going to, to share? How am I going to share it? What am I going to, to tell the others about it? But I am sure that I do have some tips and tricks to share. Uh, especially because my background is different and my relationship with academic writing is different. So uh, thank you also for the very long introduction, for the fruitful introduction. I wasn't expecting it to be so, so detailed. Thank you. And I'm really, really pleased to be here. Thank you, because um, whatever trick you used to get a distinction, you would share it with us today. <laughs> okay, Faith, you go next. Thank you, everyone. It's a delight to be here this it's morning here, this afternoon in London. And uh, yes, I hope to share the little experience I have in academic writing. I mean, academic writing doesn't have to be boring. I think we can learn a lot from Milosh because it's also about uh, creative writing. So I think, yeah, so we would get uh, a lot of value from this webinar. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. We're gonna go straight away to answering all our questions. So the reason I decided to put this webinar was because I knew that there is no amount of YouTube videos I will make, you know, that would be able to answer all the questions. And usually I make the videos anticipating what, what people, what questions people will have. And I know that it would have been a back and forth journey having to, keep answering questions on academic writing. So that's why I said, let, I'm not even the one that will share these things because I don't think I'm even qualified. Let the people who know the job, <laughs> let them come here and answer all the questions and share the experience. And at the end of the day, this is being recorded. So it can be on the channel and anyone who wasn't able to attend now can still have their, you know, can still be able to get the impact and the value from this webinar. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, it's going to be like a question and answer session. I will throw the question to those who, you know, um, all the speakers may not be able to answer all the questions at the same time, you know, because we are working with time. And, you know, as the spirit leads, I will just ask, and then I hope that we are able to cover all of them at the same time. Um, the first question I have here is that, okay, so before we start, you can drop your questions in the chat box. Uh, there's somebody who is going to, Chisom is here, she's going to pick up your question and then we will answer them, you know, in, in the process. If you have any questions 
arising from what a speaker has said, feel free to ask, feel free to ask for further explanation, ask for further pointers and try to ensure that whatever you hear, you understand before you leave this webinar, okay? Um, I have the first question here. The question is, how would you describe your academic writing experience? I think this question was from Milos because the way he told me, I don't like academic writing, but in my mind, how exactly you don't write academic, you don't like academic writing, but you were able to make a distinction. So I would, I'd like to know how your experience was, because for me, I would describe my academic writing experience as a challenging one. That's just how I can describe mine. So I'd love to hear what Faith and uh, Raina Jessica thinks. I already know what Milosh thinks. It was challenging for him, but he was able to break through. So he's going to tell us how he did that. So let's start with Faith. Thank you. Yes, definitely it was challenging. I agree because the first thing when I heard, I was I, I see that many of the people here are uh, QMUL graduates and uh, as a Chivner, uh, myself, QMUL was my second choice. And uh, I didn't, I got accepted, but I refused to attend because it was a more <laughs> academic, theoretical type of study. Uh, and I wanted to do a theater practical based studies for my for my degree. However, I chose University of Kent and I thought that, oh, OK, now I'm safe. I won't be doing any academic writing or whatever. But no, I didn't escape it. My gut reaction was, oh, my God, why am I doing this? Why should we do this? We are practitioners. We are artists. We create a piece on stage. The audience comes. There is a certain amount of emotional flow. Uh, in the process and those things. And we were required to reflect on the process about our emotions and cite other sources while talking about how we felt in the theater making process, which for me didn't make any sense. It took me a term or two to learn and understand what the lecturers wanted. So that's why it was challenging. And especially because at the end, when the dissertation came, I decided to do a pure research paper, uh, not a practical practices research paper. I don't know why I did it. I got a distinction. I don't know how it happened, but I guess that on the way throughout the whole year of studying in the UK, I started absorbing things and um, also talking to, to my lecturers and asking them details about their feedback. What do they mean? How do I improve it? And what do I do? So it was challenging and it was it like step by step. It didn't happen at once. Very interesting. Faith, would you like to share your experience? Yes, <laughs> I, mean, I think for me, um, my first experience with academic writing, it was exciting. Um, I just wanted to keep writing and writing. But then when I started the PhD program, it moved from excitement to being really challenging and um, having to find my own voice, you know? Um, like I was saying, academic writing doesn't have to be boring. You, you can actually find your own voice. You don't have to go with the conventional voice. So people have described my writing as being simple without being simplistic because that's my own style. Um, I, I really don't like the American style of writing. So yeah, so it was a bit challenging, but then it was something I loved doing. So, uh, and I also love the idea of engaging with literature and just that back and forth. It's like a conversation with uh, other authors. So that has been my experience so far. To describe it in three words, just to sum it up, it's been exciting, it's been challenging, and it's been engaging. Hmm, very interesting. Um, one of the reasons I made sure that all, I'm a lawyer, and I tried to ensure that uh, the, all the resource persons were not lawyers. We have Akinton Day here, who is a media practitioner, and Miloš, who is basically a filmmaker. Now, I'm going to direct this question to Jessica. You practiced in a law firm before coming to do, to do your LLM. How was it that, you know, because when I was in a law firm, when I was an associate, I only did legal writing, you know, and then legal drafting, uh, legal opinions. And then when I went to 
when I was an in-house counsel, the writing was totally different. I was told that, no, I don't, I'm not meant to bring in legalese and everything. Now you were there and then you came to do your LLM. How was the experience for you having to transform from, you know, pure law to academic writing? Thanks, Kisame. And that's a really good question. And I think this probably applies across a number of professions, but academic writing is very separate. But when you're practicing, particularly as a lawyer, and I'm sure in other professions as well, to Kisame's point, you're doing legal, persuasive, argumentative writing. And there's always an element of argumentation in academic writing to give your voice, but it's different because you're trying to make a point and engaging with other scholars and other research. Whereas if you're doing legal writing, you're trying to make a point on behalf of your client and taking a position. But the one commonality to remember is, and to succeed in academic writing, is take a position. And that's something you can kind of carry through to make it a little bit less daunting. But I found with academic writing, it's a little bit more difficult because it's more of a process in a different way in the sense that you have to do a lot of research. And I can tell you, I changed my dissertation topic to different variations at least three times before I kind of had an aha moment, but it took me a lot of reading and engagement and it definitely is challenging, but it's just kind of embracing the process. And if you're stuck along the way, don't be afraid to call upon your colleagues because academic writing is helpful to talk to other people in your field as well, just to help give you some inspiration. And, make you think about things differently. Whereas if you're writing for in-house counsel, they just want the commercial points, the high level business considerations and something short and sweet to the point. And with legal writing, you're trying to make an argument based on cases or legislation. Academic writing is a much wider berth. You have a lot more sources and a lot more things to consider. So I would say kind of, it's a difficult balance. It's definitely challenging, but I think it gives you an opportunity to engage in a different way and kind of change your way of thinking about a topic. That's a very nice perspective. I'm going to move to Akintinde. Akintinde is here, like I said, he had to take out, sneak out time because he's at the climate change conference. So I just, I'm, I'm very grateful that Akintinde is here. I'm going to address this question to him because he's a journalist, you know, practitioner and he studied media practice. So I can tell you, could you kindly tell us if it was the same for you? Was it was the academic writing drastically different from reporting news or you know, like you do? I don't know if I can tell you can hear me, but I hope so. Please you can unmute yourself to share. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you or we can see you. Sorry, uh, I apologize. You can't see okay. Uh I mean, you'll pardon the view because I'm actually at the protest. Uh, so I have to just leave the that guy just to get on you. And thank you very much for inviting me. And I apologize for uh, for the background noise. Father will be hearing a lot of chants from here. And, and I also think I'm not qualified to be here, especially listening to the amazing profile of folks that have been speaking uh, since. I want to correct an impression. I am not a an everyday journalist in that sense. So I don't always write, you know. So, uh, and it's a different life, you know, writing for a, class, a, a media platform and academic writing, just a different thing. Uh, but for me, I think the only reason why I had to write academic writing was because I need to pass my MA. <laughs> I mean, I just had no choice. I needed to pass, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a different thing. Uh, but I think the experience would be that um, I had to write a lot of nonsense to be able to have something at the end of the day. So it was me doing, you know, writing over and over again uh, to be able to get on it. But I think one thing that I've always done is uh, I'm always clear about what I want to work on. And I think uh, the uni University of Sussex uh, allows you to decide what topic you want to take. So I think that uh, flexibility, that just, you know, sort of being a kind of... Uh, uh, that I mean, it just you know remove that uh, imposition from you to want to get on anything that's not within your realm. So what I do is I get to my first writing experience was me. I was at a protest at that time. I think in October the entrance protest. It was the protest that actually that actually like gave me an idea of what I want to write about. So 
I only had to put my lecturer and I said, see, I was at the protest yesterday and I just had this flash that I should write about this. And I said, yeah, go for it, I can today. And then I had to then do the research to get on it. So that's the way it was for me, but it's different from, you know, the journalistic kind of writing or uh, the policy kind of writing that we do in the professional world. I wouldn't know if that answered the question, but yeah, that, that, that was it for me. Thank you. Yes, it definitely answers the question. From what all the speakers have said so far, it is obvious that academic writing is different from professional writing. It, it has its own structure. It's, it's, in its, it's in a world of its own. So that's what um, academic writing is. And we know that there's, there's a process to academic writing from choosing your topic to gathering materials to the main content of your writing. And a lot of people have had a lot of questions you know, about how to choose a topic. You know what Akin Sinde said that, oh, University of Sussex allows you to choose your topic. <laughs> it can go both ways. <laughs> I had courses that I had to choose the topic and Jessica knows it was a mess. <laughs> I kept on going back and forth because it was difficult to, you know, choose a topic that I felt like I was going to be able to write very well on. And I had a colleague who offered courses that you know, topics were given to them, like six topics were given and then pick one and it was way easier. So, you know, it's it's not 100%, it's just depending on how it works for you. I'm going to direct the next question to Raina. Um, so, because the next point here is, what would you say are the relevant steps involved in academic writing? Well, because all the questions, the questions I drafted are progressive. So I'm just going to go ahead to mention the very first confusion that students go through, choosing a topic. You know, I, I, I shared my experience of how I almost missed the deadline because I had to choose a topic in investment treaties arbitration. <laughs> a colleague had to give me a topic. It was that bad. Now, Raina, what are the things or what guides you or influences you in choosing your topic? Thank you, Kisame. I think that's a very relevant uh, question because sometimes what happens is when you're trying to do a piece of academic writing and you don't have a prompt, you don't have certain topics to choose from, it can be very easy um, to get swayed away. And it has happened with me in the past, you know, where I, I thought I was going to work on a particular case or a particular topic. And as I decided on the topic and I progressed with it, I slowly started realizing that this is probably not what I would like to settle with. And so it was, it so happened that towards the very end, around maybe four to five days before the deadline, I went ahead and I changed it. It's because the final topic that I submitted probably resonated more with me. And it can be a very daunting task. And I feel like everyone has a very personal way of how they approach, which topic they would like to go ahead with. But I think there are certain things that you definitely need to keep in mind while you're selecting your topic. And in terms of what they are for me, I think definitely will be, it has to be something that you're interested in. Uh, I've seen a lot of people choose topics for academic pieces of writing that they feel might uh, lead to a lot of good writing or is a very um, conventional topic that they feel like has generated a lot of news buzz in the recent past, but it might not be something that they're very interested in. And I feel like that is where uh, we can commit our first mistake. If you're not interested to research in something, if you do not have an opinion about something, or if you do not have uh, you know, the zeal to go ahead and research and then form an opinion, it can be very difficult to create a piece of academic writing that will also interest someone else. If you're interested in a particular topic and you're creating some piece of work on that, it'll automatically show in the kind of um, you know, writing that you have and interest other people. So I feel like that is the first thing that you need to keep in mind. It has to be something that interests you. And at the same time, I think it also needs to be a very relevant topic. Um, because I think, take law, for example, we have an ever evolving field of law and there's so many things that are happening. So I think choosing a topic that is keeping up in line with what is happening with the legal society is maybe affecting um, not just you know one party related to the legal field. It can be law firms, it can be governments, it can be um, consumers, it can be big multinational corporations. So choosing a topic that has a lot of facets to it or can talk about you know, how multiple parties are being affected, again, I think is a very good way to approaching it because it creates you a 360 degree 
you know, of looking at a particular topic. So if you have a lot of parties that are involved in a particular kind of topic, um, then you can speak from each person's perspective. And that gives you a very well-rounded view of how you're going to proceed with. And I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I think uh, lastly, it, it definitely should be like, it, this is coming from, again, what I mentioned earlier, but something um, that probably... I, I, this is something that's very personal to me, but I like choosing topics that I think um, can be argued from both sides or which do not have to have a stagnant or just gray area where you're talking about it. So it can be, you know, you can argue from um, one side and you can argue from the other side and then they can be opposing views. And I think that is a very good piece of writing where you can cater to the requirements of both opposing forces. And that really binds the, you know, the academic piece of writing together because um it's showing that there can be multiple opinions and they can all be collaborating together to form a good piece of writing so i think these things definitely help me personally choose a good piece of uh, good topic for a for a, a academic writing for sure thank you so much Raina, for that i could resonate with all the things you were saying because i went through like, I don't know. I think my academic journey was very rocky. <laughs> it was rocky. It was, it was challenging. Choosing topics, having to narrow it down. And I always, I knew when I, when I, when I, okay, so before I came, I was very interested in researching on, you know, um, dispute resolution, online dispute resolution, ODR. And then when I came for my LLM, I now, COVID happened and we had a lot of remote hearing, remote, uh, you know, hearing in an international arbitration. And I felt like it was very, I was so curious. I just wanted to know what is happening in the area of remote hearing. I didn't care whether it was a good topic or not. I was just very interested. And I remember the day professor asked, you know, people to present their research topics. And I said, I didn't even have a clear idea how I was going to frame the topic. I just said, I want to, I want to research on, I want to research about, you know, the COVID interruptions uh, for, you know, for uh, hearings, international arbitration hearings and all of that. And they helped me refine the topic actually. But when at the end of my research, you know, because as you progress, you're going to keep narrowing your research, you know, at some point I was kind of asking myself, was I doing myself more harm choosing this topic? Because every month new surveys came out varying the old surveys. So I had to keep changing and updating. And most of the resources I had were between 2020 and 2021. And it was still a revolving topic. And we will come to that. But let's ask Faith. Faith is a lecturer. Faith, please, this whole choosing a topic issue, because I remember when I was trying to choose a topic in negotiation practice, I chose the first one, my lecturer said, no, this is not going to get you a distinction. I chose the second one, she said, no, this is going to give you a descriptive essay, and I don't want to see that. Please, Faith, what are the things that you look forward to? Maybe you don't have to approve the topic for the student, but probably when you're marking the script, what are the topics that you would, you're looking out for? What are the things that you know you think students should write on, or what should guide them in choosing their topics? Thank you, Kusame. I think um, in choosing a topic, I like when you use like a bottom-top approach. Like, don't start from selecting what your topic is. Uh, start from what area am I interested in? Uh, what do I know about this area? Uh, what are the arguments that I know that have been presented in this area? Which view do I want to take? Uh, do I uh, have a view that I want to take or do I want to look at two views, opposing views and just kind of stay in the middle? And uh, so that's how I like when students choose topics that they are familiar with, not like, oh, I hear that uh, there is a relationship between COVID and access to medicine. And then I just write COVID and access to medicine. There are different areas on COVID and access to medicine. You should start from doing a read of the literature 
and then trying to narrow it down to, okay, what area of COVID and access to medicine do I want to uh, research on? Because right from your topic, you could always see whether a student has researched on something or not. Because the, the broader the topic, the, like, the likelihood is that the students just uh, caught like a buzzword somewhere and just wanted to like write something that is trendy and they haven't really researched this area. So I think most times what you want to see in a topic is that narrowing down that the student has actually read some of the literature and that uh, the student has an idea of what's going on in the literature and what's going on um, even in, in the real world before um, choosing that topic. So a little bit of narrowing down would always help. Okay, very interesting perspective. Very interesting. Thank you so much for that information, okay? <laughs> uh, well, I'm kind of guilty about, you know, very broad topics because like, <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to stop exposing myself and my rocky academic journey and I'll go ahead. So now that we have been able to identify how to choose a topic, um, Raina told us things that we, she takes into consideration when choosing a topic and Faith has been able to tell us what a good topic is and how to narrow a topic. Let's move on to the next one. Assuming we have a topic now, the next thing would be to prepare and gather materials. And I'm like, okay, I have a topic. How do I know where is the best place to get these materials? So the next question, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Milosh and Jessica this question, but Milosh will go first. How do you identify where to get? Okay, first of all, okay. I'm going to divide the question into two. For Milosh, how do you identify relevant, relevant sources and authorities in this field? How do I know that this author is the one, is, is the authority is recognizing? you know, in this area. And then to Jessica, how do I know where to find the sources? I know Jessica <laughs> has a lot to talk about in that area. So that's why I have divided this question into. Yeah. So Milos tell us how to know that this person, because what if you, if, if I have just written a dissertation on the impact of, you know, COVID-19 on ease, ease, easy access to justice in international arbitration. Is it okay for a writer or a student in this audience to pick me and to reference me? Am I going to be a good source? You know, just let us know what what yeah. we should look out for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In well, I can only talk from my personal, my own experience and what I do and how I do it and how I approach the search for for the resources. So, I believe that most of the time uh, we are more or less familiar with some authorial names out there in our uh, fields, whether it's theater, law, medicine, or whatever. So we kind of know which authorities are the ones that are mostly cited, relevant, and etc. whatever. Regarding, uh, so I, I usually start depending on the topic and the fields that it encompasses, I divide, divide it into different fields, different subtopics, I would say. For example, I was writing a research essay on uh, the ancient Greek procession, the ritual of Greek uh, procession in the ancient times, and which elements from the, that ancient time are recognizable in something which is called a cyber process, procession on social media. So when somebody passes away, uh, when people start posting things about the person, even they, even though they don't know the person, the diseased person personally. So I was trying to connect the, the, the ritual from ancient Greece in processing and the ritual in cyber grieving, let's say. So I first spoke to my lecturer and asked guidance and asked if there is already existing literature on the topic or not. So I think it's important to identify whether there is something that you can rely on or it is a very new field where you don't have any literature, which in my opinion shouldn't be explored. I mean, it's for a PhD degree, like creating new knowledge, right? If it's for a bachelor or master's degree, then it's, it's something, it's completely different. And related to your question, whether 
for example, someone should cite your work, uh, I think it's we shouldn't judge by the name or the level of, of authority. I think that if the information inside is relevant and supported with facts, with other citations, and if it adds to my work, to what I'm writing, I think that it should be cited. I don't think that the, the sources should be judged as higher authority or lower authority. Of course, there are authorities, but we should always go for the work that supports our cause, the theme we're writing and researching. And because sometimes there are pieces of academic writing that are more, they shed more light on the theme we've chosen than some other big names or writers or whatever. So it's, I also, uh, I also want to, before, before writing, it helps me when I divide my, my topic into subtopics and then I do individual research in all those directions about cyberspace, performance in cyberspaces, ancient processions, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, that's very interesting. Just um, to add to what you have said, I remember asking my project, my dissertation supervisor this question. And um, I think another cue I would give um, on how to know an authority in the field. For instance, if your topic is related to what your, maybe one of your courses, what you should do is, what are the recommended materials that has been given to you in that course and in that topic? Those repeated authorities are obviously the ones, you know, the, the recognized writers or academics in that field. And another thing would be, just like he said, yes, you can reference me, but depending on where I published that work, you should be able to use, don't just go to random Google sites to take, you know, documents to come and reference, I, especially because my name is not known in that field yet. If I have written something that is really cogent, first of all, have I published it in a reputable journal? If yes, then why not go ahead? So I think those are another two points I would like to add to what Milosha said. So let's go to Jessica. Thanks, Kisame. And just one point to add to that as well is that if you're unsure of how to go through that process, look at the journal and figure out if the pieces are peer reviewed before they're published. So for example, I know the Journal of International Arbitration goes through, you submit your publication and it has to be approved through a peer review process. And if you are looking at someone who is not necessarily a big name or a scholar, if they've had to go through that process by other experts and peers within the field to publish, and it has a lot of citations and support within the article itself, Generally, that's also a good indication that that's an okay source to cite or would be okay to cite, especially if they're not a leading figure. So that's just my advice when you're looking at the journals. But going back to what Kusama actually asked me in terms of the research, when you're looking at topics, a lot of times universities will have subject guides or subject matter databases. And that's always a really good place to start to see what databases you should be looking for or where you can look to find relevant material. I think also Kusema made a great point about your coursework. If you're looking at a topic or a particular facet of that course, look at the recommended readings and those are a good starting point as well. Um, what I always do if I can to the extent before I delve in and try to find cases and things like that, is I try to find a couple of articles or even a treatise on a particular area of law just to give myself some background and that's always a good place to start, even if you're looking in other fields, if there's some kind of encyclopedia or treaty or other guide you can look at, that's a good starting point. Another way I would say too, is that do training sessions with librarians or other established libraries through your university, because knowing how to do a proper search and say, Lexis, Westlaw, uh, Financial Times, all kinds of databases, you may be doing the searches, but if you're not doing them to the best way you can be doing them, you may be missing out on relevant sources and learning those skills are very helpful to you. And it doesn't have to be a law database, but this applies for all databases. They have their own kind of tips and tricks and abbreviations to find things. And 
over the years, I've done a lot of those and I found it's very helpful. I think my last um, piece of advice, so I could keep going on about this because research is a very broad topic, but when you find a source that you think is, oh, wow, this is really good. I really like what the author's saying. I want to learn more. Do not overlook the footnotes. You want to read the footnotes when you're reading through relevant sources because those are actually other sources you can use to lead you to other research topics or other things that may be relevant to a point you really like. Usually the footnotes are very dense or they're not, but it's always a good way to kind of flag something up. So it saves you some time because the authors are already flagged up things that may support your topic or argument. So that would be kind of my one other advice. So I will turn it back to Kuseme, but those are some tips I'd recommend for identifying sources. Thank you so much, Jessica. I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, I used to go to Jessica a lot of times for help. <laughs> in this whole academic journey. Um, just uh, to add to what Jessica had said about, you know, knowing how to identify this, you know, you know, you go to Lexis, you go to these places, these databases, knowing how to do the search is also very important. It is also important for you to know what databases you will find what. For instance, I, you know, doing international arbitration, we have Clua Law Arbitration, we have, um, here in online, I knew that you know you are you should be able to understand what kind of publications you are likely to see in these databases. There are some databases that all they do is case reviews, so it is easier if you need something, maybe a recent case, and you need a review or a summary of that case. You just go there. Right now, was the one who gave me this tip. Actually, you just go to a particular site, that particular database and check, and it, you would get it. Because if you go to other random databases who do not have like their target is not case review, you may not get the best of what you're looking for. So that is another. Understand your databases. Understand what databases offer the you know writing or the academic materials that you want and which one offers which that also helps um i just want to confirm that there's no question around this subject area so we don't uh, you know pass that question before i move to writing now we understand how to select our topic and how to find the materials now the next question will be writing but i think one person asked about how to let me get that question faith please you have to to help us again. The question says, what are the tips on narrowing down research topics? I know you mentioned it, but maybe just give us a brief recap before we move on. What are the tips on narrowing down a research topic? Thank you, Kusume. <sighs> That's a tough question. <laughs> so uh, for narrowing down research topics, I think, one thing I do with uh, narrowing down my research topic is um, sometimes you just give your topic to someone else and uh, try to ask them from this topic, what do you think I'm trying to say? And if they get too many things from that topic and say, oh, I think you're doing this, 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 and this, and you feel like, no, I don't want to do this much. I just want to do something little. And words are important. So um, you say, oh, um, artificial intelligence and authorship and copyrights. Uh, or and another person says, artificial intelligence and um, authorship or inventorship in intellectual property. So intellectual property burdens the scope of your writing, right? There are different sub ads under intellectual property. Whereas copyright is a bit more limited. And then under copyright, you're also looking at, okay, now I have chosen copyright. It's so big. Am I looking at music? Am I looking at books? Am I looking at um, artistic works? Am I looking at cinematographs? And then you, you ask yourself, is there a particular um, type of copyrighted material that I want to look at? And then that also helps you to narrow it down. So the words you use, um, are very important. That's one of the tips um, that I would give that you look at the words that you've used that it's, is this a very broad word uh, that I'm looking at international law and my topic is framed as something an international law and there are just a lot of things under international law and you're looking at is there a subset of international law 
that I want to look at. And then within that subset, are there other things within that subset that um, they are too wide? And I don't want to look at all of these things. What other, um, just carving like a niche for yourself within a particular area. I think that's, um, that's very important in, in choosing a topic. So the words you use are very important. Don't just like throw words around, try to limit those words. And sometimes people bother so much about topics. And, and I think perhaps it was Jessica or Reiner that was saying this, that uh, they had to change their topics a lot of time. Sometimes I really don't bother so much about my topic because I know that at the end of the day, when I finish writing, then I would know this is really the topic. Of course, to get um, that approval from your supervisor, you need a particular topic. But if that topic has been approved, run with it. Just go into the writing and the scope. And then later on, as you begin to write, you would continue to change your topic. I mean, before I set it for the topic for my thesis, I have like, I had like six, seven topics. I kept changing it, but at the end of the day, you would say, yes, this is the topic. But that comes with researching and writing and trying to narrow down the scope. So that's another thing. I wouldn't bother so much about a topic. Once I have something to run with, at the, at the end of writing, sometimes it's when you kind of finalize your topic. Thank you so much, Faith. I think you're very correct on that because based on my experience, my dissertation topic was the last thing I wrote when, when I completed the research. I had an idea, the area I wanted to research on. I knew that I wanted to talk about how COVID has affected access to justice. But when I wrote the final topic was when I was done. When I was done writing, I was like, okay, I'm done with this thing. So what do I think is the best topic for it? Based on what I have already written down, I was now, it was very easy for me to now coin the best topic. So Milos had already told me some days ahead because yeah, that he has other things to do. And I'm so grateful that he was able to join us for one hour. But so because he's leaving, I'm going to ask him one question that I'm going to ask all the resource persons before the end of this webinar. Milos, before you go, you had a distinction in your master's degree. I would just like to ask, what do you think, you know, what are the tips or what tips can you give current students in the academic writing that would simplify the you know the the task for them you had challenges you don't like academic writing i don't like academic writing but we all have to do it once you are in uni you have to do it so what are the things that helped you go through that process yeah. well most of all uh, talking to my advisor academic advisor and my lecturers also talking to my flatmates uh, related to what Faith said, I was constantly asking them to hear me out. So I would shortly present what I'm trying to write about because I was also struggling with defining my research question for the dissertation. I also had five or six or seven different versions of it. And then in the end, I decided to, I'm afraid to define a research question because I think it will limit my interest. I always want to write about a topic that's in, that I'm interested in, that excites me, that I want to research and read about. But if I define a research question, then I'm afraid that I will lose what I'm interested in and then it will take me into another direction that I'm not interested in that much. So I was asking my flatmates, can you hear me out? This is what I want to write or research about. And then they asked them, as Faith said, what do you think I'm going to write about? So, so that then they would narrow it down for me. I also remember on one of my one-on-one -on -one sessions with the lecturers, I was receiving feedback about my academic writing and she read a short paragraph and she pointed out that she says, you miss, you don't have focus enough, like it's not thorough enough. And I asked her, what do you mean? So she read a sentence and she says, just when the most interesting part starts, you stop writing and then you move on something else. And I said, okay, so the next time I wrote another research essay or reflective essay, I, even though I would reread it from the beginning until the end for grammar and spell check and everything, I wouldn't pay that much attention to those moments when 
the most interesting thing would start and then I would put a full stop and then move on onto something else. So I would start, I tried to read my next essays through her eyes. And I tried to locate those moments where there is more potential and where I should write in depth and analyze even more and add some more text. And I didn't start with a distinction. My first essay at university in the UK was the topic. I chose the topic. It was something that was thrilling and exciting for me, but it was my weakest essay. I passed, but it was, I had the less points marks compared to the next essays that I, that I wrote. And the distinction happened step by step. So it didn't happen at once. And also, I, it's, I think that another aspect we should all consider, or most of us consider, is that English is not our mother tongue. Our thought processes go in our mother languages, in Macedonian language for me, and then I need to write in English language. So I would also talk to my lecturers and ask them to comment on the thought process, whether is it understandable for them, so they would tell me that they see my Macedonian way of thinking, which doesn't necessarily correspond with the English flow of thoughts. And then I would need to pay attention to that as well. And it's, that's why it was also struggling, because this is my fourth degree. My second master, I also have two bachelor degrees before that. So more or less, I'm familiar with academic writing. I've never liked it, neither in Macedonian nor in English. But the thing is that when I, this is my first time in life writing academic writing in English. So that's, that added to the challenge of, of writing in general. And uh, I don't know, I, 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 I'm listening to all the people here, how thorough, well prepared and how academically you speak about academic writing and i admire that i admire the structure you have but i also think that it's not my way of thinking it's not my way of, of expressing and that's why it was even more challenging for me to to get that in, distinction and i never strived to get the distinction in academic writing it just happened i don't know how i just i think that i changed the focus and i changed the perspective through which I read my own work. Thank you so much, Milos, for that. From what you have said, feedback is very important and what you do with the feedback also has a lot, you know, also um, does a lot for you. So thank you, I would let you go now. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much for joining and us. it was really nice meeting you. I will return and watch the streaming when, when the webinar is over, definitely. All right. Thank you very thank much, you. I admire everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, so my next question is going to be addressed to Akin Cindy. Um, I usually experienced, you know, um, delay in starting to write. I would read all the materials that I probably have downloaded. I, so I, I, I was an expert in downloading materials. I would just download, download, download. Just be happy that I have enough resources in the area I want to write. I will read and I'll read and I'll read. But putting pen to paper was always a challenge. So what are the tips? I can I, I, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but if you can, what was this or what usually motivated you to start writing? What is that thing that makes you be able to put pen to paper? So if you can answer that question, I can otherwise. We'll move to the next speaker. Can you can you tell me? Hello, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Kusme. Yes, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Sorry. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's been me just listening in and listening. To. Okay, fine. What what would you do to write? You read what I know. <laughs> okay, so maybe I can just say that um, before I start writing, once I have a clear understanding of this or of, of what I have an idea of what I want to work on, right? So I first create a Google Doc. So 
So I then start dropping all my ideas. I may come across a tweet or a newspaper article or paper or whatever. I keep dumping them on that Google Doc, right? But I don't know, you know, when to start or how to start. So I just know that, yeah, I have a deadline, then I have to start writing. But I sometimes, you know, try to just collate all of those things together. And um, um, I will tell myself, I think today, tomorrow you have to do something. But I, I discovered that it doesn't always work when I give myself, myself a time to say, this is when I want to start writing. Trust me, sister, man. I sometimes it just be eating, then I feel like I want to write. Then I stop eating, and this is not a joke. I just put the food down. I bring on my computer and then I start writing. Let me share, let me share a funny story. Sometimes ago, I, I, I was I, I was I was at a party. Trust me, it was really funny. And it, I just got an idea that this should be my opening paragraph. Then I just put out my phone because everything is connected anyways. I just start writing. That's the way it works for me. And sometimes I go four days, I visit without even opening my computer when they come to me writing. I just don't care because I understand that I need to be in the best frame of mind for me to be able to write. You know? so that's the way it works for me. Sometimes um, sometimes I just leave my room. I'm like, if I'm just this room, I don't want to see anything in this room again. I'll pack my bag and I head on. There is a, a, a place we call Silverstone at Sussex. It's a building, but there is a seminar room that's always empty. That's where you see me take my bag. I may be there for three days. I would only go leave the place, go to my, go back to my flat, uh, maybe just shower, eat, then I will be back to the silver store. That's the way I do. Sometimes I'm there and I keep writing, right? And I listen to music. Once I write, I, I mean, I just put on my headphone, I listen to music, right? That's the way it works for me. And, um, and, and I also think maybe one thing I should just mention is that when I know who my examiner will be, because as subject, my, my global studies, they don't, they don't read your draft. So lecturers don't read it, but once you know who will mark it, so you, you definitely know who would, you know, grade you, you know that already. So what I do is that once I have all my writings on in one place, then I guide, I try to read the last two papers published by this examiner. So I want to, you know, see what your, you know, written thought, your line, your flow. So the way I will now do it is that when I want to write, I want to see how you, I already have my thoughts, I already have my draft. So I will just make sure that my opening, my, my introduction then becomes, I will just change it to the way you, you know, did your introduction in your last paper. So I want you to read yourself in me, you know, in a way, that's the trick that I use, right? You know, and I think it works because uh, one, one of the feedback that I got to be that the woman was asking me that actually, she writes so well, and I remember I remind me of myself when I was, and I was like, oh, okay, don't worry, <laughs> you know, that was it for me, uh, in, in that sense. And I try to also share with my my writing with you know, two, three, four persons that I know that are better than myself, and just read it. Do you think it makes sense? And you know, I think the feedback has, has only helped in helping to shape the way I do my thing. But most importantly, I have never started writing. To think I want to get the distinction. I just want wow. to Very I mean, interesting. I just want to write. I just want to write and I get on this book. And you know, my, my television grade was the shock. I mean, shocking thing I've ever seen in my life. I was not expecting that. I mean, trust me. I just did it that I was like, cool, I'm done with master's program. But main is that, yeah, I try to do my best. But I don't care. Whatever comes, good. We'll move. Thank you. Yes, I think that point is very important. That just start writing with the aim of trying to pass the message, you know, trying to, you know, just write, not because you want to make a distinction. You might end up being disappointed if you feel you put in all the work and you couldn't make a distinction. It doesn't stop the fact that you produced a good academic writing. So I think for me, what usually helps me break down the steps and just start writing is. I try to create an outline for myself. I try to have in mind what are the different things I want to talk about in different sections of the work. Once I have an outline, I create subtopics for myself and I have an overview of all the things I would like to address. And I've been able to you know, dis distinguish them into different parts, different chapters. And then I just start filling in the gap based on what, you know, what I have at hand and 
when the motivation comes. Something I understand with academic writing is it comes with a spirit. It comes with the motivation. Sometimes you've read everything, but you can't just start writing. But you have to know what motivates you, what puts you in the, that mood to write, okay? Uh, so I'm just going to move forward and ask um, Jessica. And then after Jessica, right now we'll talk about this. I didn't do literature writing. Like, you know, I know that some, some academic writing, you have to create a chapter, specific chapter for literature review. I didn't do that because I did, um, you know, well, based on the dissertation supervisor that you have or whosoever is supervising your work, the person might say, oh, I want a different chapter for literature review and all of that. Um, Faith is a lecturer she, and she's doing PhD, so I know she knows a lot about literature review. So each of us will have to say something about that. How do you conduct or write a literature review? We'll start with Jessica, we'll go to Raina, and then Faith will wrap it up for us because she is in this business. PhD researcher. So Jessica, let's start with you. Thank you, Same. And based on kind of what my topic ended up being, I didn't necessarily have to do a literature review. I looked a lot about cases and different commentaries, but that still in part does go towards a literature review. My topic was a bit more contemporary, but my main advice about a literature review is it's part of your research process. So when you're looking at different sources, it's really important that you categorize those sources into what, are the, what is that author saying in the, as their position? And that could be a, neg a negative um, affirmation or argument to what you're saying. It could be neutral or it could be something that supports your argument. Uh, the other thing to look at when you're doing a literature review in addition to that is putting them into chronological order and looking at when those sources came out. Because that gives you a sense of saying, okay, is there a lot of commentary that's very old on this topic? Or is there a lot of commentary that's very new? So it gives you a sense of how the topics developed and how you can use that. Because if you're using something that's a bit older in your literature review or a commentator or another fellow scholar, you want to generally, if you're citing something from say 1992, when there's something that's more contemporary or that source is outdated, you want to understand why you're sort of citing that particular person. So I think my advice with literature review, I didn't have to do it. I looked at a lot of different blogs and people's comments, which was partially, but mine was contemporary. But my advice is as you're researching, do this categorical exercise for yourself of chronological and then different positions. Because if you have to do a literature review and a comparison of your topic, you already have a better sense of where the literature falls and you can better make your argument to say, well, this is my position and this is others who have agreed with this, but nevertheless, this is the other side. And it shows that you're able to make a more in-depth argument and analysis of why whatever you're arguing or putting into your dissertation or thesis is the right position. Cause that's essentially what you're trying to say when you're doing your writing. So that's my advice on literature review. So I'll turn it over to Raina. She has also other thoughts on that. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I do agree. I think uh, the, the points that she mentioned are very relevant. Um, I think to me, when I started off um, with, uh, you know, academic writing, like I said, so literature review is not always um, something that is mandatory. Your work, it depends on the kind of work that you do and the kind of topics that you choose. But I feel like before anyone starts with literature review, it's very important to understand what is the ultimate aim of literature review? And according to my understanding, it is to basically um, understand what kind of uh, resources and current research has already been done on a point of um, question that you are investigating further into. So if you have a question um, that you're investigating in your um, academic piece of writing, it's important to see if there's already a lot of research on that, what, what is the standing of that current research, and how does it impact whatever investigation or research that you are going to do further into that. So take that into consideration when you're going through resources um, or any form of literature related to your um, you know, research. But I think in terms of actually writing the literature review, how I personally do it is that it 
does follow very much the similar format to your academic piece of writing. So a good literature review usually does start with an introduction. It has a body and then it ends with a conclusion. And what the aim of that to do is basically to introduce what kind of literature um, you have identified on the current piece of academic writing or topic that you're writing. And then like Jessica said, you need to categorize them make sure that you're putting it all in a chronological order and then individually identify what is the outcome of uh, the literature that is uh, relating to your piece of work. So make sure that you evaluate each piece of literature that um, has a significant contribution to your uh, area of research. If there is any particular piece of literature that is um, providing a lot of statistics or facts or figures, I think it's very important and pertinent to put that into consideration in your own literature review. And in the end, your conclusion, I think, needs to evaluate is there enough literature that is uh, there in your pieces, uh, you know, area of research? Uh, do you feel like there can be more of that? Is it influencing the kind of research that you're doing? And all of this needs to come in a very compact form in your literature review. So your literature review in the end needs to be a very thorough investigation of what kind of information you can find on your current topic of research and how that has a bearing on whatever it is uh, that you are presenting in, in terms of your own a piece of academic writing. So I think these things are definitely important to keep in mind while we do a literature review for sure. Wow, I'm definitely learning from this session. Faith, go ahead, please. Thank you, Jessica and Raina. Uh, just jumping off on what they've said. Yes, I think for literature review, I'd say there are two styles depending on what field you're in. I think in law, we really don't usually have a chapter on literature review, but people in maybe social sciences tend to have a particular chapter on literature review. And so uh, I don't know if there are people in that area, so I'll start off with that area. Just to say that um, in that kind of area, it's looking at basically what Jessica said, that. Um, you're reviewing all of the literature and trying to review them in a chronological manner. That uh, each literature is leading to another literature. Each point in the literature is kind of leading to another point in the literature. And I think a way to do literature review is usually to first read all of the literature because that's the way you can actually do a chronological or a systematic literature review. Uh, if you start off with, oh, I, I finished writing this article and then I'm going to start researching on each point after writing. So you find an article and then you write your review on that article and then you decide to find another article. I think the best way is download all of your materials, read all of your materials, make notes on all of your materials and then try to group those materials. These are the materials supporting this particular view. These are the materials supporting this particular view. This is, these are materials that are similar in terms of the arguments. Because that, what that also helps you with is to review like five materials together. You can say A, B, C, set this, 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 because they are basically saying the same thing. So there is no point having separate paragraphs, especially if there is no point of deviation which sometimes you find. So I'm just reviewing and going back to what Raina said, one of the things you're looking for by doing a literature review is trying to highlight what the gap is in the literature. Trying to say, this is the state of the literature. This is what has been done. This is the gap. This is why what I'm doing differs from what has been done. So a good from a good literature review, we should be able to see why you need to do your research because you're trying to make a case for why your research is necessary. That's yes, uh, these are the literature in this area. And this is why my research is necessary. This is the gap my research is trying to fill in this area. And also from a good literature review, we should also be able to see um, the previous scholars that are influencing your thoughts. So we should be able to say, this is the direction you are towing. These are the line of authors that you are towing their own perspective. So from a good literature review, we should also be able, be able to see that. And going to um, 
a legal literature review. It's kind of similar. It's just that you most times you don't have a particular chapter saying this is literature review, but you are in writing, you're engaging with the literature. And in your engagement with the literature, we are saying um, what your opinion is, your area of disagreements, your area of agreements. We are saying how you are gradually trying to distill what the gap is in the literature and how you're gradually showing which authors you agree with and which authors you disagree with and the why. And um, from reviewing uh, people's work and also like gradually uh, trying to master the art of literature review, what I usually notice sometimes is in a literature review, we should always see why. So sometimes people just say, oh, this person has said this and this, but I don't agree with them. That's not a good literature review. <laughs> uh, the next thing is, why don't you agree with them? Because you, you shouldn't just say, oh, I don't agree. I don't think this is good. You should be able to show why. And also from a good literature, a good literature review should show respect for the authors. Sometimes you read some people's work and you just see the way they kind of um, disrespect other people and say, oh, this is rubbish, uh, this is, no. I think from a good literature review, you should show respect for your colleagues and also try to be critical, but not um, downgrading what somebody else has said. Um, you should be able to, just to, to uh, disagree respectfully with um, the literature you you're reviewing i hope that answers the question it did not just answer it addressed the issues the pertinent issues thank you so much for that comprehensive answer faith thank you so much now um flowing from what um you know you all have said about literature review let's now bring it into the main body of the work you know when I was doing my undergrad, during when I was when I wrote my undergraduate thesis, yes, I wrote on, I did a dissertation, but I didn't really hear critical thinking. My lecturers did not really ring it in my ear, maybe because it felt like it was undergrad, maybe you don't really have enough um, grounds to probably critically analyze content or academic writing. But from day one of my postgraduate degree, I kept on hearing critical thinking and writing. Now, it has a lot of things, just like Faith has said with that literature review. In law, what you are writing, we don't have a separate section, but in writing, you are engaging with the literature. You are agreeing or disagreeing, varying and making your input. So, my question here is, how do you differentiate between a descriptive writing and a critical thinking? We will start with Jessica. So I think that this is a very big trap that a lot of people fall into when they're writing, that they're, it's very easy to write something that's descriptive, but not really being critical. And I think this is where all the tips that Faith and Raina just mentioned come into play. If you organize your research as if you're doing a literature review, even if it's not required, this helps you give you some idea of what your position is. So with descriptive writing, I'll give you an example. Say there was a recent world event or in law, there was a recent case decision that came out describing what the court decided or what happened in that event. So we'll take the COP26 meeting. You know, if you write kind of about what happened at that meeting, who attended, what was said, et cetera, that's all descriptive. Whereas critical thinking is where, and I know we mentioned this earlier, finding your voice. So it's about putting your own argument and analysis on a particular topic. So that could be that you support a current trend that's happening in what you're writing about. It could be that you disagree. It could be that you propose solutions to a problem that you've identified that has come up in your particular field. Um, it, you can do a comparison. And this is, I think, one area I wanna talk about a little bit because this is where it gets tricky, where you fall into the trap of descriptive and missing out on critical. Doing a comparative research paper, dissertation thesis, 
is completely fine and can still be critical writing. But what's really important is when you're doing that comparison is that you're not just describing the differences and similarities between whatever you're comparing. You have to take a position on what that comparison is and why it's relevant for whatever you're talking about. So that's something to my pro tip I tell you to keep in mind that if you're doing a comparison between things, just don't fall into the trap of describing the comparisons. Say, explain why that comparison and why you're doing that comparison. Because your thought process in picking different jurisdictions, different eras of history, and exactly what Milos mentioned earlier, comparing the contemporary era with Greek, um, with the Greek era and historical, showing those similarities and explaining how things trend and why it's relevant for that topic. That's a great example of where you're doing a comparison, but you're putting a critical thinking spin on it. So that would be my tips. I'm sure there's lots more to put, but those would be kind of how I would say descriptive versus critical thinking and how to make sure you do that in your writing. Okay, Raina, can you give us your own tips? Thank you so much, Jessica. That is very practical. Thank you. Um, I think I 100% agree with Jessica. It is very easy to fall into the trap of you know, going ahead and describing something instead of actually putting your voice into it. Um, and I think that is, when you're trying to do a critical piece of writing, it's very, very important to be well-informed. So I feel like, uh, whenever you're doing a piece of critical analysis, it's always very important that whatever part leads up to that is filled with information about how you are reaching the conclusion that you are. But at the same time, it should lead, again, uh, to, to some form of an opinion that you have. A lot of people, I feel, um, you know, when they do critical analysis, it's not always enough uh, to just put your opinion out there. You know, you go ahead and you describe any particular event or any particular case and you say, you know, the respondents argued so and so, the claimants argued in so and so manner and then um, this is what the judge decided and I feel like I disagree. And that will not qualify um, as a piece of critical writing because in terms of critical writing, it's very important that your own analysis goes into it. Just providing your opinion without having something to back it up, again, does not qualify as critical analysis. It's very important that when you are providing your opinion about a particular piece of fact, opinion, or whatever it is, it's always backed up. Um, with you know your own resources, with your own research, and that research does not have to necessarily be coming from the research of the two other parties who may be fighting that particular case. It can come from another piece of literature. You know, it can come from another world event that is happening at the same time or something that has a bearing on whatever opinion you have. But it's very, very important that you methodically describe how you reach that opinion and whether you agree or disagree. And sometimes I feel you know, it, it can be even in terms of critical um, thinking or writing, there can be multiple methods to do that. It doesn't always have to be that you have to agree or disagree with a certain point of law, say, that comes in our judgment. Sometimes it can be a really gray area and it is okay to weigh both options. You know, if there's something, there's a piece of uh, information and you can't decide whether you should be going for or against. But if you put forth your arguments, both for and against that piece of information, and you provide equal backing in terms of resources for that, that is still critical analysis. Because what you're eventually doing, I think is providing a platform, a well-informed platform for your reader to evaluate whatever is happening and coming to a conclusion by themselves. And I think that is the ultimate aim of uh, critical analysis is that you provide your reader with all the resources to come to a very informed conclusion by themselves, or you do it for them and you let them decide for themselves if it's a good conclusion or not. And that is what this, you know, differentiates critical analysis from descriptive writing. Because like Jessica said, in descriptive writing, you provide all the information as it happened. And it's, it's very much like, you know, how, how you would see maybe a, a media outlet describe a particular piece of news. Um, when journalists go and they take this piece of information, they're giving you the information that happened. This delegate said so-and-so, or this party argued in so-and-so manner, and this is what the outcome of the judgment was. But they're not really providing 
you any sort of information about whether they think it's right or you know whether they think it's wrong or how they're reaching the conclusion and that just merely stays descriptive so in any piece of academic writing i feel like if you're trying to really contribute to whatever feel it is that you're researching in or writing in it's very important that you really give in give a thought as to what you feel is happening over here and if it's right if it's wrong how it can be um maybe further delved into and all of that needs to go into active piece of writing to make it um a good piece of academic writing that critically analyzes whatever it is that you're doing very comprehensive thank you so much i believe that we've been able to understand what that means descriptive writing you are saying what is what is this is what it is this is what this person said this is what that person said critical thinking you're saying and so what this person said this so this person said that how important is what that person has said how has it affected things or how can you vary from what the person has said if that person has made a recommendation you know how good is that what do you think you know how strong do you think that recommendation is is it good enough is it going to affect a or is it going to affect b what are the advantages and disadvantages of this person's position why do you agree with a and not agree with b yes i agree with a but i don't agree with his um analysis i agree with his conclusion but i don't agree with his analysis you can still agree and disagree at the same time and i think what rena has said is at the end of the day you don't always have to answer a question like you don't always have to give a solution maybe a or b you don't always have to say this thing is this or this thing is that you can as well highlight a gray area places that you know there are no answers and leave it to your audience to decide but the important thing is you lay all the cards on the table don't come out writing and i say that okay i want to promote the view that covid-19 has promoted access to justice and all your materials are those resources that are supporting your point what about the resources that are you know arguing the other way and you need to bring them in and also state whether you agree with them or not and when writing don't be biased okay it's not an emotional thing you have to be very logical are they making the right points even if the person differs from the other authors that you agree with are they making a reasonable point is it logical if it's logical of course you bring it in and you just highlight the challenges or just make it a wholesome document when somebody reads the document let them see the good the bad the ugly in the situation i think that is what critical thinking is i'm going to move to akinton day to because um faith had given us a lot of highlights on literature review and the fact that it, uh, um i think the academic writing um industry or should i say academic writing is gradually moving from that giving a literature review a specific chapter to incorporating it from the beginning of your work to the end i think i actually really enjoy that because it helps you cover you know address all the issues you have to address while also you know as you progress with your writing now i want to ask akinson day you know which is the most important part of your academic writing academic writing has a structure you know abstract introduction the main body the conclusion recommendations now there is if you know when anybody takes your work okay they first read the abstract you go to the introduction and likely they will go to the conclusion before they start reading the main body i don't know if anybody agrees with me on that if you if you want to review a document you read the abstract probably read the introduction and the conclusion before you sit down to really analyze what would you say is the most important part of an academic writing and if no part is better than the other let us know and give us a critical thinking or critical analysis there why do you think so so whatever answer you're giving us you have to give us a reason akin tinde are you with us Okay, I'm not sure. Yes, okay, I, sorry, and I really apologize for being off the radar. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm just very, uh, I'm trying to run away from the the crowd. That was why I, it took me so long to respond to you. Now, 
I, I think I don't think there is a uh, you know the most important or the the least important part of any academic you know essay. I don't think so. I think especially because each each of these section you know are trying to do something you know uh, in helping to uh, let your the viewer your reader understand the issue. I remember that when I got my feedback for my dissertation, uh, the, the reviewer, the second reviewer said, the most interesting part for her, according to her, would be the, the uh, positionality. And I was, I, was, I was actually shocked, you know, and that was me speaking about what inspired the topic. And then I weaved it around some academic theory and then some other things. And she said that was what stood out for her you know, in a way. I've written essays where the lecturer would say, and the reviewer would give feedback and say what they loved about it would be, how I was able to infuse the conceptual clarification alongside the theoretical framework, you know? So it, it's, not, it's not cast in stone. So there is no, uh, and of course, the, generally your, your essay should always reflect that you've been able to give you academic scholarship. And that makes the social review the most interesting part, especially because the lecturer won't understand that you have done extensive review to know that there are gaps existing in the kind of work you're trying to work on. It doesn't make any sense if that, and that's why they are particular about the recency of your, of your references. So if you're working on your, on your literature review and say, and you are, you are, all, your, all your references you know, will be capturing 2016, what that means would be that 2017, there might have been a mutual work, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. So you can't be saying you're working on, the, on, the, on, the, on an essay, for instance, and all your, all your literature review just captured, you know, uh, 2016 or, or, you know, earlier. You understand why I mean? So it's not pretty much like there is one, uh, one rule that says one is the best part, because your introduction is you trying to say, see, this is the background, this is what I'm working on, this is what people have written about these but I am saying that this is not substantial enough. I'm trying to fill in the gap. And you're also saying that what you're talking about, uh, some people have also disagreed with your position, right? So it's, it's, it's that's very, very interesting. But I, I, I try to adopt storytelling in almost all my writings, in, in my, in, you know, when I went to see me to, to do something. I remember there was one article that I was writing that I actually used um, a screenshot from a, 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 the one I worked on, the Henstars. It was a, the screenshot that ignited the Henstars protest. Sorry for non Nigerians who are here. I apologize for using this uh, example. But the, the, the tweet that ignited the Henstars protest last year, where the guy, who, the, when the police shot one guy in Delta State, that was my opening statement. And let me shock you. When I was coming around, I also used. Uh, this man you don't they talk too much fam i use that lyrics to introduce the fact that that was the song that ignited and anger that spread across the country with the answer process it was a development activism kind of uh, writing and the lecturer actually later he said actually they now play you have to play me the music. i mean after the degree you know you already you already finished the, the ticket it was like i should play the music for him that he was interested that i would and you know the video had said that you did not even record that music for for the process but it became popular and i used that to infuse all and in all of my writing i was you know bringing sorrows okay i was using all of those you know so it all depends on um on the way you, you have to you, you need to have your style but again you need to just understand that whatever you are you're writing must be clear and must be in simple language you know so that your readers will understand what you're saying in the first to paragraph, they must understand that this is what you're saying. You don't have to be extensive in your details and all of that, you know. But again, school have different, trust me, trust me, trust me. When I read papers from Sussex, it's different slightly from papers from Edinburgh. I was reading a paper from LSE just the day before yesterday, and I was shocked to say, wait, what is this? You know, it was different entirely, the style, the everything, you know, even the reference style. Even at Sussex, people that are in the business school, they have a different style. Myself at the Global Studies, different style. At IDS, they have a different style. You know, so it's pretty much you on this. And this would like just be my, maybe not the question, because I may ask anyway, but just to say that, you know, in all of your writings, try to read 
those who have been there before you. I mean, those who studied your course, right? Who offered that module. I think that would really help you to understand what 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 it is. And it's also not bad. I don't know. I, you can also ask a lecturer and say, "What are you expecting from me?" I mean, I ask that question a lot. What what do you what do you what do you want? What do you want to read? You know, sometimes if they are if they are if they are, if they are British, <laughs> they are not very sure. They will say, "I don't know. I'm afraid." You know, they are they are not very clear about what you know. But they would say, "I would want something something like you know." Then that's where I go with them. But again, if, if there is the best way or best part of the essay, the most important thing is how you wire your story. Don't forget, you can be a great writer, but if you are not able to articulate your point, it may not really get you the best of grades. But if you are a great writer and you can echo your point clearly, you don't have to use big, big grammar that people will be confused about. No, 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 go straight to the point. I mean, get on it. And you know, um, yeah, that's it. I don't know if that's it, but yeah. Uh, Thank you so much. I think you've made really valid points. One thing I have to re echo is that academic writing is not about, um, you know, how technical your grammar is. Fine, technicality of your grammar is also there if it is like um, jargons, industry specific languages. But really, what is important is how simple you know, how comprehensible your work is. I have seen like marking outline where, you know, they assign grades to how simple and easy reading your work is. You know, when you use your Microsoft, you know, um, option or, or to edit your work or to review your work, you're going to see your word count, your readability, how easy is it? It's not about being too complicated and technical you know, make your work easy to read. I know that we are running out of time. There's so much to still talk about. So I'm just going to want us to talk about plagiarism because it is very important. Even if we don't talk about any other thing, let's talk about plagiarism and referencing. Um, what Akintinde said is very important about knowing the people you are writing for and your school. What a lawyer, you know, or a law student, how a law student will write is different from how an economist will write. So always, if you are in doubt, ask questions. Don't care if the question is stupid, ask. Let it be that you have asked and it has not been answered, then you haven't asked at all because you feel like it is a stupid question. Ask what kind of referencing style would you like? Ask what kind of, how do you want it? Is it, do you like simple language? Do you want technical? How do you want the outline? What would you like to see in the work? As long as you have the essence of having a supervisor or a tutor is to get guidance. If they knew that you knew everything, then they wouldn't assign any tutors to you or any supervisors to you. They are there to give you guidance. They are there to give you pointers. So always ask questions. So I'm going to, ask Faith this question. You know, there's a lot of misconception around plagiarism. So I'm, I just want you to explain, you know, explain to us what, what plagiarism entails. Thank you, Kusame. I think to me, uh, plagiarism entails uh, representing someone else's idea as yours. So whenever you, you pick something from another source and, and usually you represent it as yours by not referencing the source saying, I picked it from this particular source. And I think one of the misconceptions, especially like some of us who uh, studied in Nigeria and where plagiarism was not the thing that was emphasized to us and we had to study outside of Nigeria. One of the misconceptions we had uh, going into foreign investors is that um, as long as you 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 pick something a direct quote from a source and you've uh, put it in quotation marks or you've indented it that's that would suffice so I mean using myself as an example I didn't know that when I paraphrase uh, something that has been said by an author I still have to reference I didn't know that uh, when I take an idea from an author, 
I still have to reference where, where that idea came from. So it's this idea of just picking somebody's idea, somebody's thought and uh, representing it as yours. That's what I would um, tag uh, plagiarism. Thank you very much. That is the simplest definition ever. Plagiarism is using another person's idea as yours. Okay, it could be that you have used their words without referencing. You could say, but I, I you know, you could say like that you have um, paraphrased it. It doesn't matter, the idea still came from them. It is better you reference than not referencing at all, okay? So even when the idea, even when you're writing and you feel like an idea came from you, <laughs> as long as it is not an innovative idea, someone has said it somewhere, go look for it, reference, because it is safer for you to reference than not. Somebody has asked a question, what is the best style of referencing? And Akin today has answered, depends on your school actually. It does not only depend on your school, it depends on your faculty. For instance, in law, um, when I came to Kumari, our professor said, you can use any referencing style, but the most important thing is that you are consistent. Don't use Oscola in page one and use Harvard in page two. No, if you're using Oscola, use Oscola all through. And there are, there are reference guide, you know, there are guidelines, there are guidelines that you can use for specific referencing styles. For instance, if you're using a scholar, there's an scholar PDF, you know, an a scholar guide PDF that you can download and ensure that every time you are working on a document and you want to reference, whether it's a report, a survey or something, you make sure that it aligns with this particular referencing style because they also score you specifically for your referencing. When you're referencing in the main body, it's different from when you're just writing bibliography. And you will not know this except you stick to the referencing style and uh, you know use those guides. There are a lot of websites. So what I'm going to do is, I, at the end of this session, I will upload this video on YouTube and I would probably put the links to all the relevant academic resources or websites that you can you, you know, get these materials from because we are not going to be able to cover everything here. I'm going to ask Jessica, plagiarism and similarity. So we are going to talk about Turnitin. Some universities use Turnitin, universities, Queen Mary use that. So where you are able to upload a draft of your academic work and you would see your similarity score. And some people call that plagiarism score. Just like Faith has said, plagiarism is when you represent another person's ideas as yours. That means somebody else has said something and you have written it in your work without referencing the person. Now, similarity is you have referenced the person, but you haven't really, you are using the person's words perhaps. So it, it's something that a lot of people do not understand. And I would like Jessica to throw more light on it. How, what is the difference between the plagiarism and similarity and what exactly does turn it in check? Sure, I'll start with kind of the similarity question. And I think, you know, when you're making your own ideas, of course, when you're doing research, your overall analysis and your take on your topic is of course going to be informed by your research. But a good way to do so sometimes the idea or the argument you're making may be similar to some other sources or those sources may have inspired that particular argument or piece of your writing. In that case, depending on the citation form that you use, when in doubt, always include a reference. So what I do if I'm, you know, looked at some particular barrister or QC's article and I came up with my own idea, but based upon my understanding of that, I will just drop a footnote saying, see so-and-so this. So at least that way, when the reader's looking at it, they know that it's my own idea, but if they're interested in where the idea like, or the formulation of something similar came from, there's a reference. If you're using someone else's words or even paraphrasing, if you're using someone else's direct words, even if it's just a couple of them, always quote it and always include a citation. If you're paraphrasing, always include a reference. 
my biggest advice on plagiarism is that when you are unsure if it is your idea or it is a quote from somewhere, to be on the safe side, always include a reference. Because I know someone who has undergone recently a plagiarism complaint on one of their papers. And they said, I realized I probably didn't cite enough, but I referenced the scholars in my sentences, but I didn't put the citations. That's a perfect example of where if you're referencing it in your writing, do put a footnote. So I hope that answers the first part. And I think with Turnitin, other schools use this and I can tell you my experience and what I'd recommend. If it doesn't work for you, contact your university immediately and address the problem because it's a very useful tool for you to review your draft. Because when you're writing, especially something that's longer like a dissertation or a thesis, you're going to lose track sometimes of something that you may have forgotten to cite or may have forgotten to check because that's just, we're all human, that happens. So if you're using Turnitin or you're doing an exam, for example, and you're just under time pressure and you're stressed. So it's a great resource to use for there. So what Turnitin checks is they check for similarity and direct phrasing and also if your citations match somebody else's because this happened to me. So when it, what it'll do is it'll generate a percentage at the end of your, it's called, it's, some people call it a plagiarism score, but it's really a similarity score of what your different sentences and your ideas come from with other resources. My scores always tended to be a bit higher, but that's because I had citations. So don't be scared if you see something like an 18%, it doesn't mean that your paper is 18% similar to other sources. So the best thing to do is look at your score and open it up and review it carefully. So for example, my dissertation, it kept picking up duty of confidentiality or duty to disclose as plagiarism or similarity. And I knew, okay, I can ignore those, it's just a phrase. But if it picks up a whole sentence or part of a sentence, then you need to look at that source and go back and see like, okay, did I not quote this or is this too similar or did I not attribute a reference? That's where it really matters. Also what comes up in the check that also will help you give peace of mind, if it's telling you that your sentence or idea is similar to another dissertation or thesis that's not publicly available, do not worry about those because you don't have access to those. It's more about the sources that you have publicly access to or you access as a researcher. So my recommendation with Turnitin is always review your Turnitin draft and what it flags before you submit your final paper. But those are just things that I've come across in the Turnitin. But if you have a similar software, it's a great way to ensure that you definitely don't have any plagiarism and gives you an opportunity to go back and fix things that may be flagged. It's always better to err on the side of caution with plagiarism and referencing rather than just ignoring it or not checking it at all. Thank you so much, Jessica. I know that some schools like um, University of Warwick, they do not have turn it in available to their students. So at that point, what you should do, just try to ensure that if you are quoting a source, you paraphrase. Do not put direct quotation in your work from start to finish. If it enters Turnitin, it's going to be similar. So in essence, Turnitin doesn't really check your plagiarism. It checks your similarity score. So for instance, you may reference all the ideas you have inserted in your work, but it might be 50% similar. Why? Because you haven't paraphrased your points. You are using their words. You are, and it is not, it is not proper in academic writing, okay? Academic integrity demands that you do not just reference, but you paraphrase, you use your own words, you reflect your own points. So even when you have referenced, you do not need to use their words because when your similarity score, so some schools give the scores they want for their similarity. For instance, if your work is 20% similar, it might be good, maybe 20% and below. But if it is more than that, then you haven't produced a good work. So what am I saying? If you have access to turn it in, always upload your draft there and just do exactly what Jessica had said. If it has highlighted different points, you see how to paraphrase or rephrase those terms. If it is just random words that sometimes it highlights footnotes, that's fine. Because if you mention the name of a book that is on the internet, 
then it's going to highlight it as similar, but that's in the reference. But if you highlight your entire paragraph and you didn't use quotation sign for that paragraph, even when you had reference, then it is ideal for you to go and paraphrase or rephrase. I'm just going to mention a few, um, you know, software or websites that would help you with referencing. So we have sites them right. You once you are a student, you will be able to have access to it using your university login details. You also have site this for me. For instance, if you want to use Harvard referencing style and you don't know how to reference and maybe a report, you can go to site this for me or site them right, and they show you how to reference. You can also download a scholar manual from a scholar um, from Oxford website. Oh my God, I'm, I'm running out of time. And thank you so much. Uh, I think this is four o'clock. This is like four, uh, two hours gone and we are not, we haven't exhausted all the points. So I asked the question in the chat box that if you want a specific issue to be addressed, you should state it. And um, I haven't really gotten anything yet. So I want to believe that we have addressed lots of, you know, um, important issues that the audience would like to hear. Let me just look for one last point I think is important for us to address before we bring this session to a close. Okay, I'm just going to ask, yes. I'm just gonna ask one last question to all our presenters or all our resource persons today. Thank you so much to the audience for staying and thank you so much to our presenters. So my last question will be to everyone. We'll start with um, Raina and we'll go to Faith Akintinde and then Jessica, and then I'll just give a closing remark. Now, what would you say must be present in any work that must earn a distinction in academic writing? I understand that we had said earlier that you should aim to write to be understood, not to earn a distinction. But I also know that if you aim to get to the sky and you can't, you can at least get to the rooftop. So if, if you aim for a distinction, there are higher chances you will drop at an upper merit because I know that all the courses I wrote and I was like, I really need a distinction in this. Even when I couldn't get a distinction, I still got upper merit. What if you aim for upper merit, you will land on merit. <laughs> so always aim high. Now, we're gonna, you're going to tell us, use that, that course that you had a distinction, that essay that you had a distinction. Faith is going to tell us from an eye of a lecturer who has scored the scripts and who is also doing an extensive academic research PhD. So you're going to tell us what do you think must be present in an academic work that can end a distinction? Final words, final words. I know I've kept you guys for so long. So sorry about that. Let's start with Raina. Thank you, Sam. I think, you know, there are a lot of things I think that go into um, a piece of academic writing that can get you a distinction. I know this is a bit talk to multiple professors about it, and everyone seems to have uh, different opinions. But I think the one thing that is constant in all of the advice, and we've touched this, is that it definitely needs to be a critical piece of writing. It needs to have your own voice and your own opinion. Merely taking certain information, describing it, and telling uh, you know, the, the reader that this is what we have, this is what we have, is I think not enough to an extent because after you've taken all of that information, how much are you analyzing it? How critically are you analyzing it? And how backed up is your own opinion is very important. There are two things, first of all, that it needs to have an opinion. It needs to either, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it needs to either have a side, so you're either supporting the stance, you're against it, or you are uh, evaluating both and you are trying to say that there is a gray area which needs to be addressed. This is one of the things. And I think secondly, is that all of your opinions are very well backed up with either information, with literature, and any other piece of information that you're collecting from good sources. So that me as a reader, when I read a piece of academic writing, I feel like, okay, so the ultimate aim, which was introduced in the abstract of this piece of uh, writing, you know, that this was the question that was supposed to be answered, is being answered after thorough analysis that has been done throughout the body of the entire text. So I think that is the one thing that really needs to be there in any piece of academic writing if you want to really reach that distinction level. 
Thank you so much, Rana. Um, Akintinde, are you there? Faith will speak last because I know she has a lot to say as a lecturer. Yeah, Akintinde, what do you think must be present in an academic writing that can earn a distinction? It's difficult to answer, this <laughs> uh, but I think, um, you know, originality of idea, you know, uh, matters when it comes to hand. Of course, it also depends on the the lecturer, the course module, and um, and the argument you are trying to bring, you know, on board. For instance, uh, if you are if you are working on any paper, there should be a, a general tone of academic literature on this subject matter. You must know what what that is and what you are bringing on board. For instance, maybe it's an area where your lecturer researches on. So that means he or she would be in tune with the latest research in that space. And whatever you are bringing to the table must really be exceptional, if you know what I mean, in that, in that, in that sense. But at the end of the day, uh, because I've seen the paper that would, I mean, I've seen the paper that I think was not, um, was better than mine that got, um, I think 75. And I've seen, you know, myself get 82. And I was like, what is this? How did I even get it? You know, so it's honestly difficult to judge, especially because you have different people, different ideas, different opinions. And all of that, but I would advise that if you just make sure that make sure you are submitting your best, right? You know, you must have done your research, make sure that your reference is very is up. No, I mean, the way you also, you know, format your reference is also really important, right? And all of that. So, I really can't say, yeah, this is what to get the distinction or, or whatever, but I think uh, if you make sure that you what you're working on is uh, to the best of the energy. And you give you know a third or a, a second or a third eye to look for you to look at it for you and be very brutal in their feedback. I think it would really work. That's why I like to work with Google Doc or a track changes on MS Word so that whatever you know you are able to track all of that and then to make sense with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akintine. You see what you said about giving it to a second or third eye. <laughs> Your, your eyes will be used to a document you have been working on for the past two, three weeks or one week. You know, you may not be able to identify errors. It happened to me. I finished my dissertation and I thought I was done. And I was like, okay, let me just give it to a few of my colleagues to read through the typos. And <laughs> the typos that came back, I was shocked. So please always try to give your work to a third person who is not used to that work to, you know, check out typos for you because if you have produced an excellent critical thinking and analysis work, but full of errors, they are gonna mark you down and there's no big deal about it. They are Hi, going to Kutame. mark you down. Yes, yes. Hello, Kutame. Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. I, I just want to share this experience and I, I would really rush it, you know. Okay. So when I, when I my dissertation was uh, 15,000 words, so when I, uh, it was like three days with deadline and I had sent to I hear Can you please just check this thing for me? And I told him I need to submit, you know, uh, on Tuesday. It was on a Friday. On Saturday night, he sent me a message on WhatsApp. He was like, hey, bro, can you seek extension? I was shocked. I said, what for? He said, you have all it takes to make a good paper, but honestly, uh, I think you need to really restructure your, your, your tone. And I was like, guy, I think I'm done. So what I said, you know, the, the feedback, this, I mean, this document, 15,000 words, this is not me joking. It had not less than 27 comments. I mean, brutal comments, 27. And it was saying that I should please seek extension. I was like, guy, I can't seek extension. Today is on the Saturday. I will submit on Tuesday. There is just no miracle to get extension unless I, I mean, I said I might have COVID and you know something, something really. So I, I, you know, I had to work, and I think I was in London for the Chimney. Um, what did we even do on that Saturday? I can't remember. We had one get together in London. So I was on my way to Brighton when the people came in. So from that night through till that I submitted, I honestly was working on that feedback, and I, it, and it really helped. Because, you know, when I, I mean, I, it was not me getting out of that material, but it was just me restructuring and making my point be very punchy. 
because because I like to write a lot of words, so most times I'm always wordy. But my lecturer would say you should make sure that for every sentence you don't go beyond one fifty to two hundred words before you you just call it so that you don't disturb the flow and you don't confuse who is reading, especially because you are not that kind of you are you are you, are, you I mean you are from a different line, you know where. You have to explain, 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 and explain. So that's it. Uh, I just wanted to add that into, into it and just, just to make sure that you are conversational in your, in your writing. The conversation, let it be like you are talking to your lecturer. You know, let it be like, it's, like you, you are having a conversation. So um, that would be it. And um, yeah, thank you. Sorry for Thank you so much, Akintinde. We'll move to Jessica. I'm going to keep mine as kind of high level tips because I'm eager to hear Faith's comments. But I think one thing I'd recommend at the onset is if your university has a rubric of its grading scale and what is required, what will get you a merit, a distinction, and a high distinction, please read that. I did that with Queen Mary, and that's how I was able to know what I had to include in my dissertation to get my distinction. So I recommend that for you so you know what your lecturer and what the expectations are on a more uniform level. With respect to proofreading and errors and things like that as well to Kasame's point, your eyes get fatigued. We're all online all of the time. I learned this when I was actually an associate. Anytime I had a brief, I'd print it out and I would hand edit with a pen. So when you are done writing, that is one of my pro tips to print it out and edit it by hand because you're going to see different things when you're using a different skill and you'll catch a lot more errors before you send it out. One other thing I would mention is make sure you do a wide variety of research because that's going to do you a favor and get you a distinction in your writings. If you can demonstrate that you've done not only research but you're able to adequately and clearly make your arguments by incorporating your research but also giving your own original thought, that's the way you're going to get a distinction from your lecturers because it's showing that you have a mastery of the topic you've chosen but you've also been able to do critical thinking and can make your arguments concise and clear within an organized fashion. And I think lastly is always start with an outline but don't be married to your outline. The outline should evolve as your research process evolves and as you get more education and it's a process. So just be patient with yourself. But I probably have five or six different timelines of different outlines I saved over time. And I can see how my topic developed, but it helps you when you're actually going to make your structure, you have, you've been developing your structure as you go along. So those are a couple of tips I'd give. I'm gonna turn it over to Faith because I wanna hear what she has to say as well, but that would be what I'd recommend. Yes, thank you, Jessica. Just to add to what Jessica has said about the, you know, your, your, um, showing that you have done a lot of research. So one of the comments I got from my dissertation was that I was able, like they said, the student has shown extensive research because that, you know, a range of resources was used from journal articles to, you know, primary resources like case laws, uh, you know, um, legislations, you know, published books, surveys. So don't, don't use only journal articles, don't use only books. Let there be a range of resources from different aspects, websites, blogs, you know, publications, uh, different ones. Even sometimes you could even use videos to to to. You can reference my YouTube channel. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, let there be a range of resources. Let it not just be primary resources. Let it not just be secondary. Let it be everything like an holistic approach to your research. Faith, we have all been waiting for this moment. <laughs> I feel under a lot of pressure right now, <laughs> especially because I don't have anything new to add. I feel like we've all engaged with academic writing that we know like what an examiner is looking out for. And yes, I think the most important thing, which is something that is common to what all of us, all the other speakers have said is originality of thought. I think that's so important. That's something um, that wows any reader, that uh, you're not just presenting a bunch of um, ideas or literature from like existing work. We want to see 
how original your thoughts and it doesn't have to be something that is outside of this world uh to use jessica's words it's really am i really reading your voice in this work or am i just reading a bunch of like other people's voices and just wanting to see where is the author's voice as the author really engaged have you so immersed yourself in that in that work that I can see you, I can say, this is your work. <laughs> that, that's something that is always important. And to do that, you must ensure that the work is not descriptive. And I know we've talked about it. this. Uh, critical thinking is so important. You must ensure that uh, you're always answering the why question. Why, why is this so? Uh, why is that so? Can you still hear me? my battery is low <laughs> okay yes so you must always answer the why question make sure that your work is as original as possible original to the first I think another thing that distinguishes a an a paper from a b paper is um the quality research and by this i mean um the resources you've used how much of the literature have you engaged with are you a lazy researcher <laughs> or you are such an hardworking researcher that you've, you've just read through so much literature and you are, there is a degree of expertise that is required of you when you, especially when you're writing like um, LLM dissertation, uh, you should be at that time, the expert on that, on that issue. You should be the one person who has read so much on that issue, more than the examiner. The examiner should be learning from you because you are the one researching that area. You're the one who should have most of the information on that point. So I think what the examiner wants to see is, have you graduated from a student to a researcher? Have you graduated? Because you, you should be the expert, to be honest in that area at that particular time, you should be the one to say, this is, this is what is in this area and just bringing your, your critical perspective to the point. And um, I also believe one thing that distinguishes is um, the grammar and English is not my first language. I mean, I grew up speaking Yoruba and it's just in schools that you learn English and I go back home to speak my native language Yoruba. So, Always be humble to say, yes, uh, English is not my first language. So I am going to put this through, say, Grammarly or give somebody else to edit this work for me such that, um, yeah, my grammar is up to date. I think one thing is I usually am able to find is I know a student who just rushed through work and a student who didn't rush through work because it would show from your grammar that you had no time to edit this work you would just see that your students had no time to edit for grammar. So you should always edit for grammar because you may have such original thoughts, but the flow would always be broken by all these grammatical errors. And then that distracts the reader from the quality of the work that you've done. So always edit for grammar. And lastly, don't be afraid to give your work to somebody else to read. Don't be afraid of critical review. <laughs> I think we are all, we and myself inclusive, we are all scared of feedback. We we can usually give people feedback and uh, but we are so scared to receive feedback. Whenever I receive feedback, like if I'm going to bed, I don't want to open it. I'm waiting till the next day because that's what I would be thinking of throughout the night. So, but don't be scared to receive feedback because it improves the quality of your work. There are some things you would never say. I've just finished writing my dissertation and it's, like about 130,000 words. And if I decide to read that on my own without giving it to somebody else, I mean, I am going to just lose track of a lot of things because it's my work anyway. I can't read this without very, very critical. So always give your work to somebody to provide such critical feedback before it goes to the examiner. I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. I can't thank you all enough. Like I have kept you guys for two hours, 20 minutes. I can't thank you guys enough for, in fact, I have learned so much from this session because 
I am very interested in going ahead with academic writing, and I know that there's still so much to learn out there. So we're going to bring this session to a close now. Thank you so much for all of you who joined and for staying till, till now. We had over 170 people register. I don't know what happened. Maybe they cannot just take all the information that came in. For you who stayed till now, thank you so much. There's going to be, I'm going to upload this recording on my YouTube channel, which is Kuseme Ise. Uh, so you can just subscribe and click the notification bell so that whenever I post content, you will be aware. I'm going to be answering more questions on academic writing that we were not able to answer in this session. Please let us know if this session was beneficial to you in the chat box. I appreciate the resource persons who have spent their time here with us. Thank you so much to Chisum who was there monitoring the chat box and you know getting important questions to us. Thank you to Pinel who read out the profiles and have been there to support Toroja. All of you have been there from day one. I couldn't have done all of this without you. I'm going to just request that we take a picture. If you can, please turn on your cameras so that we can just take a picture. If you do not turn on your camera, I'll probably just um, you know take you out of the chat or the picture so that we can have all videos on. Please, as a kind request, turn on your cameras, let us see you, let us take a picture, and let us appreciate our resource persons in the chat box. Like I said, I'm going to be bringing more content on academic writing oh. because it is all that matters, okay? Academic writing has a lot to do for your writing, even if you are an undergraduate. I'm still waiting for people to turn on their cameras. That's why I'm just talking. Even if you are doing your undergraduate degree, if imagine you get it right in undergraduate degree, you don't, you can't imagine what you will do in your master's and in your PhD. It's going to open up a lot of doors for you and it's going to simplify a lot of things. The things I am learning now, you must have already learned and that's going to make everything simple for you. Okay, we have a few more people. Teju, Isaac, Inimbom, Jonathan, Baba Wale, your cameras are still off. Thank you so much for those who have turned on. I'm still waiting on the last few people so we can take this picture, okay? It's very, very important for video evidence. Oh. <laughs> okay, we're still waiting for a few more people, but I'll just go ahead and take this picture now. Okay, say cheese. <laughs> I'm taking more shots. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Like I am so overwhelmed with information, but I have to stop because I've been talking too much. <laughs> thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Raina. If you have any further questions on academic writing or postgraduate studies in the UK or you know, postgraduate studies abroad, drop a, qu a question in my YouTube or in my Instagram and I will always be here for you guys, okay? Thank you so much. Um, Faith, Jessica, Raina, Akintinde, thank you for all of those who joined. I'm going to bring this session to a close now. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kusame. <laughs> Thanks, Faith and Raina. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Faith, I'll bring you back to talk about research uh, proposal. I'll probably bring you on the channel because we didn't have the time to do it. <laughs> I hope that you'll be able to be available to oblige us. Oh, that, that's fine. Always happy to chat. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.